Hey y'all, it's Jennifer. Welcome or welcome back to my channel. Today I am coming to you with my November wrap up. And as tradition dictates, we are filming the November wrap up in front of the Christmas tree. Now I have not done a wrap up for the past few months. I honestly don't think I've done a wrap up since the summer. And basically it's just because I felt like I was covering all of the books that I was reading in vlogs. I also was pre-filming quite a bit. And so when the time of the month rolled around to do a wrap up, I really did not have anywhere on the video schedule to slot it. And so this month I have read a lot. It's been a great reading month. I feel like historically November always is. And I did not do a lot of vlogging in November. So I thought it would be great to kind of return to form with a wrap up for November. I actually only have two physical books here. And so I think we should go on and get these out of the way first because the rest of the books that I read, I basically read on ebook. And then here towards the back half of the month, I actually have been listening to a few audiobooks, which is unusual for me, but I hope is a sign of things to come. First things first, let's talk about The Girls by Emma Klein, which is a book that I feel like I am really, really late to. So many people have been singing this book's praises for years, and I am just now finally getting around to it, and I am so glad that I did. This book is kind of a fictional retelling of the Manson murders, and it is specifically a take on the group of girls that followed Manson. And that is a case that has always been extremely fascinating to me and is frankly the only true crime case that I know anything about. I really do find it genuinely fascinating and I think it's because I don't understand the mindset of a cult like this and so I am constantly trying to figure out how do you get into this position and how do you fall under someone's spell so completely like that. This book kind of opened my eyes to the fact that for a lot of people in situations like that, they just don't care. There isn't a deeper reason for doing it. Now, for some people there is, and they're finding meaning in their life there, or they're finding value when they haven't had any previously, which is really what Charles Manson did. He would pick people that he knew uh, weren't really conventionally attractive and so maybe hadn't had great relationships in the past and so they were just happy to be shown attention at all and that's shown in this book but really for our main character and for a couple of the other side characters there's really no reason for this. Part of it is that they want to act out, part of it is that they don't really know how far this is going to go. Really in my opinion this is just a truly beautifully written book. You can see that I tabbed it and I really tabbed the first half. The second half did not have as many quotable moments to me, but this was a really interesting look not only into something like the Manson murders, but it was also kind of a really interesting look into the teen experience and specifically girlhood, friends that you have when you were a child, and how formative your teenage years can be because there was a dual timeline element to this where as an older woman she is looking back on this time period and reflecting on it and I just thought it was really striking and frankly it stuck with me a lot and about halfway through I thought I was going to give the book five stars but it didn't quite get there for me. I automatically picked up Emma Klein's newest book, The Guest, so I am really excited to get into that. This was a really pleasant surprise to me. I felt like I was going to like this, but I didn't realize just how much I would. So I'm really, really glad that I picked this one up. The Big Daddy of the Month and the last physical book that I have is The Brothers Karamazov. And I picked this up in kind of a fugue state when I was sick at the very beginning of the month. And frankly, it did take me the entire month to tackle this. And I didn't think it was going to. When I initially started this, I thought, oh yeah, I'm going to be able to get through this very quickly. But the second half just kind of lost me a little bit. This book is precisely why there needs to be half star ratings on Goodreads. I'm sorry, because I think objectively, so much of what we do here on BookTube and in terms of book reviewing in general is subjective. It's really up to you and what you like. But on an objective level, I really do think this book is great. And it would probably be rated highly by most people. For me, I feel like this book is definitely above a four star, but it is most certainly not a five. There were too many issues here for me to ever consider giving this book a five star. I feel like if I want to really get into the nitty gritty of it, this is maybe a 4.25. This has two very distinct parts to me. The first part of this 
is very philosophical. It's kind of dealing with a lot of deep thematic content. There are a lot of really interesting conversations going on, not just between the characters, but in the subtext. But there's not a lot happening in terms of plot. But in the second half, a lot is happening in terms of plot, but they've kind of abandoned for the most part. There are still a few really lucky moments, but for the most part, they have kind of abandoned the deeper topics and the thematic conversations that they wanted to have. And those were the things that made the first part of the book special to me. So depending on the type of reader you are, I really do think one part of this book will connect with you and the other part won't. And I was wary going into this because I saw more than a few booktubers this year DNF this book. And I think it was because they needed a little bit more plot. And so that first half really was a struggle for them. And to me, the second half was the struggle for me. I had really great positive emotions about this throughout the first half. And then the second half, it just became very tedious. And I got to the point that I really did not want to read it anymore. And something else to keep in mind is that Dostoyevsky envisioned having a sequel to this that never materialized because he died so soon after the publication of this book. And so there are some elements to me that just were never followed through on. And so I feel like if we had his kind of envisioned sequel, this book would seem stronger. On the other hand, what I think the sequel would have been about would not have been of much interest to me. But this is a really complex and complicated novel and it's reflected in my feelings on it. I really don't know how to feel about this. And something that's kind of negative about the experience, frankly, which I never expected, is just how forgettable large swaths of it have been to me. And this is one of my most recently finished books, but I feel like there are so many moments that I just can't remember. Things that you would assume were big parts of the plot or big moments of character progression, that has all kind of left me. And what I remember are certain quotes. And I guess your feelings on this are really just gonna depend on the type of reader that you are. If you are a plot heavy reader, you're gonna struggle with this first half. I don't necessarily really care too much about a plot if what you were giving me is interesting. And that was the first half of this to me. In fact, when it got back around to the plot, that was when I wasn't that interested in it. And so I just think this is an interesting book. I don't really know where I will slot this in terms of Dostoevsky. It's definitely after The Idiot. The Idiot is my favorite book of his and it will remain so. Nothing will ever beat it. But I don't really know how I feel about this one against Crime and Punishment, which I also think was really interesting thematically, but was clearly the tighter book. So I have a lot of complicated emotions about this, and I rated it four stars on Goodreads, mostly because I do think the book deserves more. It's definitely like a 4.25 for me, maybe even a four and a half but I felt like putting it as a five star in a year when I've had so many great books that I consider five star reads, new all time favorites, this did not stand out to me the same way that a lot of those books did. And so I really couldn't rightly give it five stars. I know that sounds like, wow, I have no taste because I wouldn't give a Dostoevsky book five stars, but I gave a Holly Black book five stars, but there's no accounting for taste. I'm really looking for emotional connection and enjoyment in my five stars. And to me, the philosophy and the conversations between the characters and the brothers Karamazov, that was great. But otherwise, I wasn't that emotionally connected. Shall we talk about a five star just to show how unhinged I am? Uh, let's talk about Big Swiss. This is a book that I just finished on audio not that long ago, and my gosh, it has stuck with me. I initially gave this four stars, but I had to go back today and just confess to myself that it's a five-star read. I'm obsessed with it. Big Swiss has had a lot of hype this year. In fact, I think it was nominated for the Goodreads Choice Awards, and disappointingly, it did not move into the finalist category. Are we reading the same book, y'all? This is unhinged in the best way possible. This is everything I want out of literature, to be honest. This was crazy from start to finish. I didn't know where this was going. I felt dread, I felt anxiety, I laughed out loud. It was incredible. It was just amazing how much this book served me on a platter, just every form of entertainment known to man. It was cutting, it was biting, and it was also very self-introspective, and it required you as a reader to kind of look at yourself and wonder how you would act in certain situations. But our main character in this book is uh, transcribing for a sex therapist. And a client of his comes in who's from Switzerland. And so she nicknames her Big Swiss because of course she doesn't know her name. 
And this leads into a cockamamie scheme where she actually meets this woman and then makes up an entirely new identity for herself in order to be friends with her and not let her know that she knows essentially everything about her life. And this has been recommended to me many, many times, especially when I say that I like certain kind of unhinged women books. This has come up time and time again, and I am so glad that I got to it before the end of the year because frankly, it's one of my new favorite books of the year. And the audio experience, I really wanna say, was easily the best part about this because there were multiple narrators and since she was a transcriptionist, we got to hear the interviews done with different voice actors, which I just thought really aided this. And is part of the reason, frankly, that I have struggled with audiobooks in the past is that I don't like people putting on those fake accents and doing those corny voices. Please miss me with that. That is just not for me. It used to be that I could literally only listen to nonfiction on audiobook because of that. That just really bugs me. And so when an audiobook has a full cast, I'm more inclined to pick it up. And I personally think the full cast did such an incredible job with this. And the voices so clearly matched the characters. It was just a fantastic reading experience on top of being a fantastic book. And I'm always skeptical when it comes to reading books that I read on audio, mostly because I feel like since I'm not really an audiobook person, I think I tend to rate them a little bit higher and I give them the benefit of the doubt because I assume a lot of the time that I would have enjoyed the book more if I had read it physically than if I had listened to it. That is not the case here. I actually really think the audiobook aided this experience, but I also still feel like this is a book I truly would have loved reading on the page, just reading physically. I feel like no matter what, I was set up to really, really enjoy this. And I'm so glad that this book has gotten some hype because it clearly deserves it. It's definitely one of the weirder books that I have read this year, but weird in a really great way. Now, if you wanna talk about a weird book in a way that I don't actually think is that positive, uh, let's talk about Death Valley by Melissa Broder. I went out on a limb here because this was suggested to me after reading Big Swiss. And basically everything that was suggested to me after reading Big Swiss was a book that I have already enjoyed, except for this one. And so I felt like this is gonna be a shoe in for me. Definitely, I am going to love this. In some ways I did. This is a weird, weird, weird book in a way that is really bizarre. It's really hard to describe. And I think the best way I would describe this book is like if you've ever had Medicine Head. Now, I don't know if Medicine Head is a term that everybody uses or if it's just something we made up here in the South, but Medicine Head is something that occurs when you take like a drowsy medication, a nighttime medication, let's say, you're taking like a cold medicine to go to sleep and you somehow miss that interlude when it was really gonna drop you off. You somehow don't go to sleep right when it tells you to. And so you kind of lay there in like a fugue state, wondering if you're lucid dreaming, wondering if conversations you had, you had in a dream during this time or if it was actually real. A lot of the time you're like sweating and clammy. That is how this book felt to me because a lot of it I questioned the reality of and the main character questioned the reality of. And so Death Valley is about a woman whose father is in the ICU after a terrible car accident and she's trying to come to terms with the fact that she might have to let him go and her husband is also chronically ill and so in a way she's just been a caretaker for a long time but she also finds herself getting really really frustrated with them and she knows that she's being selfish and she's making their medical conditions all about her and how she reacts to them and so she takes a vacation and goes to a Best Western in the middle of Death Valley. Someone at the hotel there tells her to take one of the more scenic hikes in the area. And when she does, she sees a giant saguaro cactus and she kind of goes inside it. And no one at the hotel, no one she talks to about this believes it because saguaros are not native to California. And so she kind of wants to prove this cactus is out there, but it basically morphs into a survival story of being like stranded in the desert. And that of course lends like a dreamlike or fever dreamlike quality to the writing and to the narrative, which also makes you question the reality, but it's constantly interwoven with memories of her dealing with her father and dealing with her husband. And so in many ways, it's like a metaphor or on grief, like she needed to go through some sort of hardship in order to feel 
compassion or empathy for them because she's objectively not really a good person. What I'll say for it, this book is short. And I also really thought that the themes were interesting. I was kind of interested in how grief was discussed here. To me, it was really fascinating to see it from the lens of somebody who clearly was in fact making it about her, but also the concept of grieving someone while they're alive and not knowing what to do for them, what you can do for them. And so I thought that was interesting. I just don't know that any of it was particularly handled well. For sure, the writing was beautiful and I really enjoyed her writing style, but my gosh, this was weird. And it was weird even for me. And I would say objectively, I'm just a girl who loves a weird book. But this kind of went over the edge for me very, very quickly. And the back half of the book in particular was just surreal. I wound up giving this three stars and I'm glad that I read it because I do see why you would compare this book to something like Big Swiss. There are definitely undertones of weirdness there and also undertones of humor that I think are key to my enjoyment of any of these kind of weird or unhinged books. I really like that a lot of the time the books are being serious, but they don't take themselves too seriously. And that was definitely the case here. This just by design wasn't for me and it really did not connect with me at all sadly enough but I still thought it was pretty good and pretty interesting and it made me think so I settled on a three star for this one. Let's talk about One Dark Window. This is the fantasy romance of the month for me and I'll be real I don't know that I would necessarily call this first book a fantasy romance. To me this is just more straightforward fantasy with a romance subplot. To me, the romance did not take the main stage at all. And there was so much going on that I thought was interesting, but this is a very gothic inspired world. And in fact, I actually do think the book was very gothic. A lot of the time books are described as being gothic and they most certainly are not. I really think this duology was, and it really understood atmosphere and world building in an interesting way. Our main character survived this sickness as a child where normally people who get this sickness come out of it with strange magical abilities. And so the king wants anyone who survives this fever to be killed, but her family hid her away, of course. And so she does have a magical ability that is really, really interesting and frankly is incredibly unique to me. The only other form of magic in this world comes through this deck of playing cards and certain cards will allow you to do certain things. And there's only a limited number of cards in the kingdom. It's a really fascinating world. This first book to me was great, fantastic. I just did not want to put it down, but I struggled just a little bit to connect to the characters. I constantly felt like while reading this that it was going to be forgettable to me and that probably in about a month's time I wouldn't be able to tell you the main character's name or her love interest's name, but I felt like I just needed to wait for the second book. And so Two Twisted Crowns came along. I have some interesting feelings about this. I personally really loved this, but to me, this book here is fantasy romance in a way that the first one wasn't. It's also insta-love in a way that I don't appreciate. And it is, in fact, in many ways, about different characters than the first book. And I think that will really throw people because I've seen some mixed reviews on this and I feel like that's the main critique, that the main characters of the first book are most certainly not the main characters of the second. Personally, I love the main male character of the second book so much. I was just happy to see him get a time to shine, frankly, but I can see why that would bother you. And a lot of it is that the first book is kind of written in first person. You really only see it through one person's eyes the entire time. The second book is in third person from multiple perspectives. And I kind of question that, frankly, and I wonder what was going through her head because things happened at the end of the first book that clearly indicated the path the second would take, but the first book feels vastly different to the second, in my opinion. And I just kind of wonder if you were eventually going to be multi-POV, why that wasn't present in the first book as well, because I think that's led to the disappointment factor, because I can see when something's written in first person, you just kind of think this is the person that you're going to stick with throughout the series. And that is not what happened here. But I personally love this second book. The second book actually makes me love the first book even more. I gave both of these books four stars, but it's kind of a five star series, I'll be honest. Because the fear that I had in the first book 
is so not true. I have not forgotten about the characters here. I haven't forgotten about the plot. I have not forgotten anything about it. To me, it was just so vibrant and interesting. And I think a lot of that is due to the fact that the world was so unique, in my opinion. And it was just ideal for this time of year. It feels very cold, autumny, wintry. It was just a great book to be reading as we kind of shifted into the end of the year. I absolutely loved this series. I highly recommend it. I think it was just absolutely fantastic. I'm so excited to see what else comes from Rachel Gillick because this was interesting to me on so many different levels. The characters were interesting, the character dynamics were interesting, but her sense of aesthetic and of crafting a vibe was really fantastic to me. And so that's what's really got me excited for what comes next from her. Let's also talk about another unhinged book that I just listened to on audiobook. I know what's happening to me. This is called My Husband by Maude Ventura. And this book was originally written in French, so it has been translated. And I am going to say, I got this book recommendation from TikTok. I had never heard of this book prior to seeing a TikToker talk about it. And I have to say, it is one of the few times that TikTok has steered me right. And actually one of the few times that TikTok has mentioned a book that was previously unknown to me. And so maybe I'm finally getting onto an area of book talk that really appeals to me. My Husband is another really short book, but it's about a woman who is completely obsessed with her husband. To her, he can basically do no wrong, semi no wrong. She's just obsessed with him. She's still kind of in the honeymoon phase of her relationship with him 15 years into their marriage. And they have a couple of kids together and it's so interesting how she literally does not care about the children at all. It's basically all about her husband and you get the sense she had the kids just because she thought her husband would want kids or that was just the next step that you should take. So she's a really interesting person. The bad thing here is that it gets repetitive very, very quickly because you're spending all of your time in this woman's head. And so how often can you really hear her say that her husband is so fantastic and is so great and she's obsessed with him and she wants to make sure that she looks good for him and so she's gonna go get her roots touched up and she's gonna go get her nails done, but she doesn't want him to know about it because she wants him to think she came out of the womb looking this good. I just really enjoyed this throughout, even though I could tell we were just constantly retreading old ground and at some point during the reading process, I even wondered what the point of the book was because she was kind of giving her husband punishments when he didn't show her affection or love in a way that she thought was uh, appropriate. And that was interesting. And I always thought this was leading to something kind of eventful in the middle part of the book. I thought there was going to be a major plot point around some of these elements that was going to kick off maybe a kind of a crime vibe. I really did think that possibly somebody was going to get killed. Right when the book started off, I thought this is going to lead into a murder. But I'm going to say you do want to read this until the end because to me the end was absolutely fantastic. And when I finished this and updated on Goodreads, I saw so many reviews that said they really hated the ending. So some people don't like it, but I'm telling you what, the book is worth it for the ending alone. And I think the rest of the book kind of falls into place once you've read the ending. But I thought this was fantastic. I mean, I just was really floored by this. It was really interesting. And if you want to know, I think this is one of the first modern books that I have read that's been translated from French. I feel like everything translated from French that I have ever read has been a classic. And this has really got me intrigued about modern French literature. We then have The Emperor of Rome by Mary Beard. I'm really going to save the majority of my thoughts on this for a video where I recommend some recent nonfiction that I've been reading. And that video is essentially going to be my nonfiction November wrap up. I'm just trying to finish up a couple of things now to be able to include in that video. But this was my first read of nonfiction November. This was an anticipated release for me, I know. And I know it was for a lot of people. Mary Beard is very, very famous in the classics community and everyone seems to love her. And I'll tell you, I was the odd one out because I really did not like her prior to this reading experience. And I felt like I was going out on a limb here because I read SPQR a couple of years ago. And this is a book that everyone raves about. And frankly, I don't understand why, because SPQR jumps all over the place. There is no linear timeline. The chapters move around. You're jumping between time periods. 
And the fact that that is a book that is consistently recommended as a place to start with Roman history is genuinely appalling to me because I don't really think it's that welcoming to someone who knows nothing about ancient Roman history. And so I went into this with some trepidation. Yes, we still jump around, but this makes far more sense. This book is all about just the daily life of being a Roman emperor. And so it is broken down into different chapters on different themes. So we have eating. What do we like to eat while we're laying on our couches? Which they did. They did in fact lay on couches to eat. We have entertainment. Are we gonna go to the Colosseum? Are we going to the chariot races at the Circus Maximus? And so each chapter had a theme which she explored through multiple different emperors. And so she does jump around in time a bit, but I think it makes more sense here. And I think the episodic quality to the chapters also really aids her because it's definitely a book that you can stop reading and pick up later and not feel like you lost anything or feel like you've forgotten important information. It's a book designed to be read in those chapter segments. And so I think that's kind of the brilliant thing about it. I really enjoyed it. I am a little disappointed that she didn't go further. She kind of capped her uh, date range at some time in the 200s. That's understandable because things went off the rails in the third century. That's why they call it the crisis of the third century. Some weird stuff was going on. And so I kind of see why she stopped there because the definition and the idea of a Roman emperor changed around that time period. But I'm someone who likes the late Roman Empire. And so I was kind of disappointed that that wasn't touched on at all. More so than that, I was disappointed that she clearly had some favorites that she talked about time and time again. Now, one of her favorites was Nero. That's all right by me because I love Nero. Nero is one of my favorite Roman emperors. I will not shut up about Nero. Nero was a Sagittarius king. We're not ready for that conversation. He was unhinged. He was not a nice person, but my gosh, he's fascinating. So I did not complain anytime he showed up, but there were several other emperors who just made multiple appearances. And you thought at some point, can we see somebody else? Can we mention someone else? But again, she's working with sources that maybe favored only certain emperors over others. All in all, to me, this was worth the read. And if you have been skeptical of it, I would say pick it up because I actually think it's a lot better than SPQR. But again, its thesis is all around what's it like to be a Roman emperor. That's the entire point of this. You're not gonna get much in terms of political background. You're not gonna get much in terms of the wars, but you do kind of get context for how the emperor functioned during those issues and during those times in different roles as the emperor, emperor as soldier, emperor as statesman. You kind of got a peek into those areas, but I think it's up to you to kind of find books on those topics if that's what you want. That's really not what she was interested in doing with this. So I thought this was unique and I'm really glad that I read it. Last but not least, let's talk about The Woman in Me by Britney Spears. Yes, okay, I also read this for Nonfiction November and I'm going to be real with you. This was good, but it wasn't great. And I don't blame Britney for this at all. This book is remarkably short. And I have heard rumors, and I don't know how true they are, but I choose to believe them, that there was a lot of this memoir that was left on the cutting room floor. And I choose to believe that because she really did not go into detail on anything that she wanted her to. She would mention that something happened, but then she kind of moved on really, really rapidly. To me, the eye-opening quality of this, of course, is the conservatorship that Brittany was under. And that was something I knew next to nothing about. I was there for Free Britney and I was paying attention to it, but I actually did not know what the conservatorship entailed for her specifically and how it affected her day-to-day -day life. And that was really horrifying to me, but I think a lot of people went into this for some juicy Y2K drama. And that really just did not occur in my opinion. Yes, things were said about Justin Timberlake, but I think most of us knew what he was like. So that wasn't shocking to me, but I wanna say something about Brittany. She's just such a nice person. She's just a genuinely sweet person. That's how she comes across in this memoir to me, because even though she mentioned the things that people did to her, like Justin, like her parents, like her sister, she mentions that, and then she moves on. She doesn't really condemn them for doing it, which I think is really admirable. I have a lot of respect for her for how she conducted herself in this memoir because if it was me, I would have dragged a few people over the coals, but 
That's just me. So I'm proud of her. I'm glad that she didn't do that. And I think that gives this memoir a respectable quality that maybe other celeb memoirs don't have where you're just spilling tea all the time because I feel like her purpose here was really to talk about the trauma that she endured under that conservatorship and it was really interesting to hear her talk about it. In terms of celeb memoirs this year, this is clearly the standout for me with Spare by Prince Harry. I'm sorry, everyone can hate that all they want to. That book actually gave us what we wanted. We wanted tea and Harry gave it. But Britney's is important in an interesting way and I hope is kind of a door opening for others to be able to tell their stories. This is a really, really interesting memoir. And again, if you've been on the fence about it, I say pick it up. It was really good. I just wanted so much more from it. It was really, really short. And I really do believe that somebody told her to cut some things out of it. And to me, that's a really big shame because I can tell that there were opportunities for more detail to be given. But maybe this was all she wanted to tell. And if so, good for her. She told what she wanted to tell. Memoirs are interesting and they're hard to rate because so often they're being written by ghost writers. And a lot of it is, I am just not in a position to judge you telling your life story to me because I'm not going to judge your life story. And I feel like an interesting memoir has to be from someone who's lived an objectively interesting life. And Britney Spears most certainly has. So this was fantastic to me and it really is worth the hype. I think this is going to win the Goodreads Choice Awards. I really don't blame anyone who's voting for it because it's truly thought provoking in an interesting way and it makes you have a different perception of fame, which I think is interesting and I think is kind of the purpose of a lot of these celebrity memoirs, that the grass is not always greener. So I also really recommend this one, but I had a great reading month in November. I hope that December can keep this up because I really do like to finish out the year on a high. I'm looking forward to December reading. Hopefully I can kind of get into some wintry Christmas spirit and read some Christmassy books. But I would love to know if you have read any of these down below, and I would also love to know what you read in the month of November. But that's going to be all for me today. I hope you're all having a great week. Happy reading. Goodbye.